All right, pause. Good stuff today. We're going to discuss odd objects. Should be fun. Yeah, buddy. This is a fun topic. And, um, you know, odd objects are one of those things that you can inject into your program to add a fun factor. And um, I think there's some real utility in there as well. So, yeah, should be a good time. I agree. Odd objects, I would say, you know, you hit the fun thing, which is great. They're almost an antidote for workout boredom. I think they're yep. fantastic. They're different. They're, they throw some variants in there, but they're also effective. And somebody said this. I can't take credit for it, but I love odd objects. If you're, if you're that gritty classic CrossFitter that is still doing, you know, what I like to say that I do, and I mean is training for the real world, for real life. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not training for an upcoming competition. I'm training to tackle whatever I need to tackle when I walk out the door. That most of the stuff in the real world that you may have to pick up or move is probably not going to be a 28 millimeter in diameter <laughs> barbell that's 8.75 inches off the ground with this nice knurling that helps your grip. Probably yeah. not. It's probably going to be some odd, awkward piece of whatever that you've got to figure out how to manipulate and, and do the work with. And so for that reason alone, uh, odd objects should have kind of a place in everyone's heart as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and I think the same can be said for kind of a sporting application. You know, most sports are not done in a vacuum. You have to control another object or you have to control another person. Or there's a very dynamic situation unfolding that doesn't always go the way that you want it to or move the way that you want it to. So it can be it can be useful in that regard too. And and I think about it kind of in a big picture um, concept where really what you're doing with an odd object is taking uh, the basic patterns that you learn with a dumbbell or a barbell or whatever, and you apply them to something more general. And so you can argue that you pick up a sandbag, it's going to have its own technique. Well, of course, that's true. But the broad technique that you learn with a barbell under like perfect conditions, quote unquote, you can take that and apply it to something that is a little bit less perfect and see how close your uh, broad technique is when you actually have to put it to the test. Universal so kind of motor recruitment patterns. That's right. That is right. <laughs> yep. All the good old nerds out there. So let's, let's loosely define the category. When we okay. say odd objects, what pops into mind? What are the things that we're thinking of? Yeah, I mean, immediately what comes to mind for me is sandbags, sleds, mm -hmm. some type of strongman implements like a yoke, yeah. um, maybe a fat grip bar that doesn't rotate, um, you know, things that are not as common as barbells and dumbbells, etc. That's what immediately jumps to mind for me. Yep. And you also mentioned, maybe you didn't, uh, did it and say the stones as well, kind of yeah. in there, you yep. know, with, with D-balls under the sand, uh, strongman stuff. And we chatted beforehand that you could broaden that. There are no rules, right? You can broaden that, <laughs> that category of odd objects to what's just odd for you, meaning yeah, it's outside definitely. of your normal wheelhouse that, of what you train with. So if you yep. are an absolute 100% barbell enthusiast, and there's always a barbell in your hands, and the dumbbells have four years of dust on them in the corner, well, you could make a serious case that that's, that would be training with an odd object view because you just never do it and it's going to yeah. hit you a bit different. Or if you just don't ever touch the kettlebells and suddenly you're doing thrusters with a kettlebell in each hand instead of a barbell, most certainly I think that would be perfectly fair to throw that into the odd object camp as well, really. Yeah, absolutely. You could take that a step for, uh, further. And you know, if you have somebody who's just like a body weight master, they're just a, a breathing heavy, running and chinning champion. <laughs> and you put a barbell in their hands, if they're not used to it, then that becomes odd as well. So yeah, you can extend that any number of ways. But I really like that as a big picture idea that an odd object is one that doesn't find its way into your training with regularity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, classically speaking, you're going to kind of go towards that strongman style uh, implement. But I think broadly, you should keep that in mind that there's plenty of potential with regular objects, quote unquote, if you're not using them regularly. And I'm already going to go down a very short rabbit hole. And perfect. Uh, and, and 
And there's plenty of things on this list that aren't classic gear that maybe you work out with for your strength and conditioning. But if you get creative, you can make some amazing things happen. Do you remember a yeah. name, Boz, by the name, uh, a gentleman by the name of Erwin Van Beek? Oh, I sure do. Absolutely. I remember <laughs> running into Erwin uh, during the um, days that we used to do seminars in Virginia Beach. I believe he's a, a Dutchman. Yes, I memory believe, serves. I believe so. And he's also, I mean, he's a tough individual. I think he's like a judo yeah. guy. And That's right. I, and a judo, yeah. I think he was a high-level judoka. I remember. And uh, I think he was involved in law enforcement at some, uh, some point, too. Was potentially that? so. Okay. I remember walking into that training facility one day and he was just in there by himself covered in sweat lord only knows how long he'd been in there no barbell no fancy training stuff he just had what i assume is some sort of like you know fighting judo mma like punching bag you know kicking bag you know it looked like a tackling yep. dummy from the nfl it was like five or six feet high this cylinder of just heavy dense whatever it was it weighed about 150 pounds. And I mean, if you wow. can imagine also how big that is, it's just so awkward yeah. and miserable. And all he was doing was basically, it was laying on the ground. He would just straddle it, grunt it up to his shoulder, throw it to the other side of his body, <laughs> then just pick it up again. I mean, he was just continually picking up this 150 pound, miserable, awkward object off the ground and just kind of tossing it. And I guess that's what you do with human beings in judo, right? And it's like, well, yeah. If, yeah, if you get absolutely. comfortable doing that, I bet that translates to the sport that he's doing a little bit better than that 29 millimeter neural barbell, right? Yeah, potentially. Well, let me push back on that just a little bit. I agree with almost everything you're saying there. However, I do think that sometimes there's this romanticization of this austere training approach. Mm. And the barbell is the most... Um, widely used tool for a reason. And that reason is, you know, the technique that you build on the bar does apply all over the place. The barbell is such an easily adjustable tool. Sure. It's so versatile, the number of movements that you can do on it. So I think it's important that, um, you know, we just don't get too far off the track of saying better, or worse than, um, because take it or leave it, I would say, man, the barbell is going to win out every single day versus these other tools. But Absolutely. Like you're saying, for his particular sport application, taking that strength that he probably developed a lot of on the bar and mm -hmm. then putting it into something that is going to, you know, replicate moving a body around a little bit closer. Absolutely. Great application. Oh, no. Um, I mean, but just, you know, let's just make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, correct. 100%. I mean, there's, well, the application and the feel of ripping a sandbag might be a whole lot closer to ripping a person off the ground than a barbell. Yeah. As far as regular training application to build explosive power, to build the coordination, all that, there's a reason when every single day that I walk into my garage that I grab overwhelmingly a barbell and not the yep. sandbag. Because on a yep. daily basis for training, I'm in total agreement the barbell is going to be in my hands. And then every now and then for some glorious variants, we're going to go ahead and work in those odd objects. Yep. Well, let me, let me also say this about odd object training. You know, we've kind of established some, some basics as far as what the most common odd objects are. We've talked a little bit conceptually about odd objects being things that just don't find themselves in your training regularly. I want to talk about two particular movement patterns that I think are super critical for anybody that wants to be fit broadly that are harder to replicate with conventional equipment. Mm. And that is dragging and carrying. Mm -hmm. And those, I think, are the two biggest bang for your buck movement styles that odd objects really do a good job of introducing. So dragging something a distance um, in multiple different ways, you know, forwards, backwards, whatever. There's a million different variations on that. Mm -hmm. And then same thing with carrying, picking something up, having to stabilize it and move it somewhere. Again, that could be out in front of the body, that could be on the shoulder. I mean, there's a bunch of different variations there too. Your grip, how you choose to do that. Uh, but those two patterns, I think, should be something that everybody's exposed to on a pretty regular basis. Caring is so miserable, especially just Absolutely. like in a front bear hug, just can't yep. breathe, midlines on fire. What's happening to my spinal erectors and glutes? I mean, just 
caring is pretty fantastic. And it just hits you in a yep. weird way if you work it into the workout when you come back in and do whatever the next piece was, if you're doing it as part of a, a greater workout and not maybe just like a standalone accessory piece or strength building. Yep. I would say what I would like people to know is all the gear that we just mentioned from sandbags, D-ball, stones, yoke, yokes, sleds, et cetera, et cetera. If you are fortunate enough to wander into your garage or your affiliate or wherever, and you have this just cornucopia of toys available to you, you should always feel authorized to work it into darn near any workout that you want because if oh, yeah. it keeps you having fun with your training and makes you fired up to get into the gym, it's great. You know, I program for a living and there's a reason, even though I have this a lot of this gear in my garage, that I program 99.5% of the workouts with barbells and dumbbells. Because yep. that's the gear that most people do have. You know, if 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 a lot of workouts had as wonderful as they would be, sled pushes, um, some D ball work, and then a yoke carry, you'd have a blast if you had it, but it would exclude the overwhelming majority of, of people that were looking to work sure. out that day. And so that's probably why, even though these things have tremendous utility, you don't see them pop up as regularly as you see barbell work, pull-ups, dumbbells, things like that. But please, to anyone out there, if you've got them and you understand how to replicate the movement pattern with whatever object you have, you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you that you can do it. You, you can go ahead and, yeah. and fire that up. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think you can add a couple of guidelines in there. Um, one would be with an odd object. Generally speaking, the load is going to feel heavier than it actually is. <laughs> yes, sir. So for example, <laughs> if you are taking a workout, like let's pick a really basic one. How about something like Grace? 30 mm -hmm. clean and jerks per time. Great effort. I love that workout. I think it's always going to be um, something that is like just a, a really clean test of fitness. Uh, that's done at 135 for the gentlemen typically and 95 for the ladies. If you were to just fill up a sandbag to 135 pounds and say, all right, play a 30 clean and jerks, let's go. That should, be, be, should very, be right around my barbell time here. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be a very different experience for most of us than 135 pounds on the barbell. You're probably going to need to either do one of two things. Take the weight down to try to get a similar effect or understand that maybe the target number is going to be a little bit lower. Maybe it's 25 reps, maybe it's 20. You, know, you have to play mm -hmm. around with that a little bit. But generally speaking, less is more when you get into the odd object territory. So sometimes that might seem uh, pretty intuitive, but it can be surprising how demanding that can be. Um, so don't wait until you're in the third round of your workout to figure that one out. Uh, start conservatively if you're starting to plan workouts using that equipment. As somebody, you and I are so different on this because I have terrible <laughs> overhead position. You have an amazing overhead position. As, as somebody with a terrible overhead position, I'm always so jealous and envious of people that I see be able to do grace with like a D-ball or a sandbag. Yeah. And they're just in this narrow, locked out overhead position. And I mean, so if you have the ability to work it in every now and then, uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's a fantastic thing. I'll give you a real yeah. world example of what you're saying for the loading. So let's take a a classic workout that has it's like a 2159 that has a power clean in it, like an Elizabeth sort of thing, you know, cleans and ring dips. Although I think Elizabeth should be done with squat cleans. That's a different story. But let's just say it's power <laughs> cleans, okay? 2159 uh -huh. power clean, 135 or 95, and the ring dip. And you're like, you know what? Jeez. Bosman motivated me. I listened to the last very not random. I'm going to use the sandbag or the D ball today. Kind of like what you're saying. Okay, maybe you're still going to do 2159 and your quote unquote power clean is going to be a ground to shoulder, a ground to over the shoulder. And if you have, uh, you know, maybe you can fill a sandbag with whatever you want, but the, the D balls come fully loaded and you're probably going to mm -hmm. order one that's either like 100 pounds for the guys or 150 is like one of the next steps. And if you have those two objects and you're like, well, 135 is kind of right in the middle. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> it's actually it's actually closer. One, 135 is closer to 150. I'm going to grab that. You've made a grave mistake if you're a normal human. <laughs> you would Agreed. Be, you would be, for most of us anyway, maybe you're the fire breather that's like, nah, it feels the same. For most of us, 
actually grabbing that 100, even though it's not as yep. close to 135, is going to much more closely replicate the stimulus, the time domain, the effort level. And trust me, even though if you haven't used these things before, that that little voice in your head might be like, I'm going to get short changed because if I do the math, that's 35 less pounds over 45 reps. Now it's you will not be shortchanged. I, I, Absolutely. I want and, you and to I'll trust say, me in that. Yeah, I'll say one thing on that too, depending on the type of athlete that you are, you know, both of us are kind of speaking from a place of, uh, you know, a little bit more season. We've got some miles <laughs> under the belt yes, at sir. this point. Uh, I wouldn't say that either of us is particularly old in the scheme of things, but, you know, we've got a big training history behind us and um, everything that goes with that. And speaking for myself specifically, I... I'm not the most robust of athletes. I move pretty well. I've got good technique. You know, I'm generally pretty fit person, but I have to be really careful about being in the right positions at the right time. I'm not particularly robust. You know, you can't hit me with a truck and I'll just get up and keep going. There's, there's some people that are like that. You just can't break them. You know, mm -hmm. I am not that athlete. Um, and so for that reason, in addition to what you just said, I have to be pretty conservative when I start playing around with odd objects, like oh, much okay. more so. That is that is not the time for me as an athlete to really be pushing the limits of what's possible. Um, you know, that time is when I can get perfectly set up with a bar, et cetera, et cetera. And for that reason, you could probably make a sound argument that I should be doing odd objects more regularly to improve that kind of robust quality. Um, but I got to approach it at the level that makes sense for me not with this kind of scaled up mentality of, ah, well, you know, whatever, let's just throw caution to the wind. So mm -hmm. that's just one from personal experience, something that I think you have to kind of be mindful of is was what kind of athlete are you generally? Are you a little bit more on the, the bird bone Bosman side or are you a little bit more robust and durable <laughs> right. and, and uh, you know, react accordingly? Yeah. And I, you know, I've, so I've got, I've got a, a decent sandbag selection in my garage from back when I had to test some uh, workouts and things like that. Some of which I just don't use, quite frankly. I've got a, <laughs> uh, I think I have an 80 pound sandbag, a 100, a 150, a 200, and a 250. Okay. Ooh, 250 is brutal. That's a, that's a bear. <laughs> All I do with the 250 <laughs> is, is almost throw my back out trying to like roll it so I can clean behind it every now and then and then I roll it back to wherever it is. Uh, the, you know, I'll use these every now and then just to give people more ideas as like a fun strength day. So let's say yeah. my, you know, sticking with the power clean analogy that we've said here and I chose the lighter weight to do in a metabol, you know, a multi-round mixed modality workout there. If the workout of the day was every minute on the minute for 30 minutes, one power clean. well. I might walk into my garage and just do ground over the shoulder with that 150, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I would just do 50 reps at a, at a casual pace. And that, even though I could power clean more than 150, at the end of that workout, moving the sandbag, again, I don't feel shortchanged. Or one of the things that I would do is that might be one of the very infrequent times that the old 200 pounder will get rolled, rolled into the uh, into the gym, and I have a um, the name's escaping me a reverse hyper mm -hmm. in my garage, which is usually just used as a table because I don't have <laughs> I don't have the actual leg attachment that I really like. So if I'm being honest, it's usually just a table, but it's at a great height that is you know, kind of midway up my torso. And that works really well. If I want to do a fun strength day, I'll put the 200 pound bag on the ground and I'll just basically do like loads. I'll bend mm -hmm. over, pick it up, yep. get it up, set it on the reverse hyper. That's one rep. And then I just pull it off, let it flop to the ground. And I'll just slowly make my way through a bunch of heavy sandbag loads. It's so much fun to do that every now yep. and then. It in, And I'm somebody, I'm one of those oddballs that, I do every single solitary solitary heavy day that comes up because I know how important they are. But I'm the weirdo that doesn't really enjoy heavy days. And so I, I'm right there with you. And yeah. so every now and then doing something like that makes me fired up and really enjoy the heavy day. So I, I, I give myself yep. the grace to work that in every now and then and I never feel shortchanged. It's a blast.
Yeah, well, that just jogged a memory of, of one of my favorite combinations. Uh, you talk about loading something to a platform. Um, I love kind of big guy, little guy combos. And so one of my favorite things to do with that kind of loading concept is if you have a platform like Pat's talking about, that'll work. Um, or if you have an adjustable pull-up bar in a rig, you can set it to a height that is... Um, you know, kind of challenging for you to get something up and over it, mm. but also kind of challenging for you to get under. And a great combination is getting something over that uh, that height and then getting yourself under and doing that for reps. That's really fun. Or you can do a little bit higher and go over and over. So what that means is you get the object over and then you get yourself over. Repeat. So not only do you have to navigate this awkward lift, but you have to have the agility to get yourself over this thing efficiently as well. And I, I love combinations like that. They're so fun. You know, some other maybe outside the box things that people might not think of right off the bat. But again, going back to like what I said, if you have the gear, I really think you should authorize yourself to do this every now and then is with, let's stick with grace. So yep. if, if uh, you know, 30 reps of clean and jerk. So maybe for Grace, you're going to do something crazy and you're going to have your 135 or 95 barbell on the ground and then you happen to have a yoke. What you could do with the yoke is raise that cross member very high and the people will get mm -hmm. under it in like a, almost like an overhead squat position, stand it up and then do an overhead carry with it. Now, I probably have to say this on the internet you want to go ahead and make sure that you're capable and competent and safe to do that because the last thing you want to do is drop a 185 pound yoke on, on your head or something like that. But it, it it's done all the time. It's an amazing head to toe strength builder. And maybe your sure. grace every now and then looks like instead of 30 reps for time, it's three rounds for time of 10 power cleans with the barbell. And then whatever is the appropriate distance to walk that thing locked out overhead. Now, you're not getting the press. You're not getting the explosion of a, like the hip drive and the push jerk. You're not getting the receiving position. So undoubtedly, there are some differences. But there is so much tremendous benefit to the variance, to getting a bit outside your comfort zone, that in the grand scheme of all the workouts you do over the course of the year, the fact that you did a little bit of a different grace today, your grace time is going to be just fine if that's what's really important to oh, you or, or something absolutely. like that. You're going, to be, you're going to be just fine. And yeah. really, again, it'll be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to go the other way for a second here. And that is um, things that are kind of a pet peeve of mine as far as what I think is a goofy application. Okay, here we for go. Odd objects and stuff like that. So I said that <laughs> carrying and dragging are kind of like great things to do with these odd objects. They're the two motor patterns that I think are um, underutilized with stuff like a barbell. Dumbbells certainly lend themselves better to that sort of application. But Anyway, you guys get the idea. Here's an application that I think is totally goofy and should just go by the wayside. I cannot it's wait you... to hear this. Okay. So you have a workout like Helen, 400 meter run, 21 kettlebell swings, 12 pull-ups, repeat three times. One of my all-time favorite workouts. Beautiful. I think you and I agree. One of the best. Um, sometimes people will look at that workout and say, okay, what is going to make this quote harder? And they say, oh, Boz said carrying things is, is, is a good thing to do. There's utility in that. I'm going to make the run harder by having all my athletes carry a 20-pound medicine ball mm. on the 400-meter run. I hate that. I can't, I can't <laughs> hold it in anymore, Pat. I think, it's, I think it's a misapplication of both ends of the spectrum. You want to mm -hmm. make Helen harder, you have your athletes run harder. Right. That's what makes that workout harder not trying to load the run in a way that just kind of is an annoyance. A 20 pound med ball is just awkward and annoying. It doesn't really add a lot to that workout. However, if you wanted to include that carry aspect to a workout like Helen, you should go the other way more. Don't put yourself in that awkward middle ground. It's either run faster or carry with significance. So maybe instead of the 400 meter run with a 20 pound med ball that just is annoying, you take a 100 pound sandbag and the distance is 25%. Right. I don't know what that correct number is. You'd have to play around with it a little bit, but your carrying Helen would be a significant carry mm -hmm. for a shorter distance that makes that effort significant, and then the rest of it stays the same. Yeah. That would be an example of a good application of that. So it's that middle ground that kind of gets wishy-washy, and I think sometimes 
it's born out of the, you know, a good idea. Oh, this element needs to be more challenging or it's something we don't normally do. Fine. Mm -hmm. Just don't land it in this middle ground that serves none of it. Uh, yes, I, I, I certainly see what you're saying there. And, and that has my, that has my thumbs up as well. And the, and not that you, I don't think that you meant this, but just in case anyone at home is maybe um, under the assumption from hearing that, that it should never be done. I don't, I, you know, that, that, that would be a bit extreme. You know, there's this line that there's, sure. a di there's a difference between variance and bad, bad programming, right? And so if you were doing that all the time, and every single time that there was a run, you made your athlete carry something, I think you're going down a road of ineff ineffective bad program because you're just robbing that stimulus, like you said, of what it should be. Now, if every now and then, you have the athlete, they're carrying a med ball or something, but it's it's infrequent. Well, then it's just this little bit of exposure to something that they don't mm -hmm. normally do. And that is a different thing than what you're talking about. And so sure. it's, just, it's just good for somebody at home to understand the difference between the two because com completely <laughs> correct. And I appreciate, I appreciate you trying to soften the blow of my disdain. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm there for sure. You know, like beyond a shadow of a doubt, all that, all that would have done to Helen is ruin a beautiful workout. Mm. I mean, I mean, really, yeah. to be honest with you. So here's a different, uh, another thing you could play with as well in keeping with one of the things that uh, I think you said is what a great application of it. Now, this wouldn't be, well, maybe you could make it Fran-esque. But anyway, I'm just going to use Fran because it's such a well-known workout. Thrusters and pull-ups, right? And so maybe you want to do something to mix up the pull-ups. You can still do the thrusters with the barbell or dumbbell if you want a bit of variance there. And then what you could do if you got the distance correct and the loading correct is stand your ground, bend over at the waist, and do this hand over hand rope pull of I a heavy it. sled back yep. to you. Yes, it's undoubtedly not exactly the same as a pull up, but it is a phenomenal upper body pulling movement. And again, you're not going to be short changed. And doing that now, should you do that every single solitary time that pull-ups are programmed? I wouldn't recommend that you do. You're going to mix it in every now and then. Mm -hmm. I think it would be of a wonderful benefit uh, to your athletes and a great way to work that kind of a sled pull in. For sure. And, and that's um, one of those underutilized movements, in my opinion. It's a really, really good one. And it's a great way to progressively work towards a legless rope climb. Yeah. A lot of athletes, they get comfortable with a lock-off style rope climb regular. You know, they use their legs in whatever style suits them. And then there's this huge gap between that and being able to do a legless rope climb. You're like, well, I can do pull-ups. You're like, okay, that's not necessarily going to get you any closer. Um, how do you bridge that gap? Well, you need something a little bit more progressive. Weighted pull-ups could be a way to do that. But that bent-over position with a progressively heavier sled can be a way that you can close that gap. Uh, with with time. So that's a really good movement that I don't think many people do often enough. And that's a great example of what we spoke about earlier. The fact that that, you know, if I programmed a workout tomorrow, I said, okay, great news, everybody, go ahead out, go ahead outside. I want you to measure off 100 clear feet. I want you to have a hundred <laughs> foot manila rope and, you know, break out yeah. the sled. Two people out of a thousand would be like, cool. And everyone else is like, um, I can't do this. Thanks yeah. for nothing, I guess. But if I said, all right, well, then you're going to do pull-ups. And now I've armed you with the knowledge that if you do have access to this other thing, you're always right. authorized to work that in. Cool. Phenomenal. Kind of like you said earlier, while there's great utility in these odd objects, why do we come back to the barbell so frequently? Because it is just so ubiquitous. It's so darn useful. It, it builds head-to-toe strength, explosive power. And then you can do these other things at your leisure, at your convenience, you know, when they fit well for you. And this would be another, uh, another one, you know, yeah. uh, one that I've done before and is a fun, uh, a fun way to play with it. And I haven't done it in a while is that classic CrossFit workout of Annie sit-ups and double unders, mm -hmm. but just every time that the sit-ups come up, you can do a short, heavy yoke carry and it'll punch your midline just fine. Or, and I've never done it this way, but you've kind of inspired me maybe the next time that Andy comes up the appropriate short distance heavy carry, you know, to oh, work yeah. that midline as well. Yeah. And yep, that heavy carry, yes, it's different. It's not flexion and extension at the hip, you know, like you would in a, a classic sit-up, 
But trust me, fitness will be achieved. Your midline will be <laughs> strengthened. You know, you'll you'll notice an odd cardiorespiratory component when you come back to the double unders. You'll wonder what happened. Everything will work no out question. just fine, and you'll have an absolute an absolute blast on it. You know, one of the other things I would say, and I don't do this that often, but I would encourage people to do is if you have a sled, a prowler, whatever you want to call it, you might be able to put that into a workout, but you'd have to do it appropriately, you know, kind of going back to like what you said with with Helen or something. If you had a multi-round workout that there was in this three, four, five round workout, uh, some short time, not a long time, but a short time of high intensity that you're going to do on the rower or the bike or something like that. And you had I would actually encourage somebody a lighter sled than they think so they can move fast with that thing, get that heart rate up, get that breathing rate up and light up the backside like you would feel on a row sprint, on a bike sprint. That could be another really fun way to do it. But of course, you've got to have the gear, you've got to have the real estate and you know it has to make sense for the workout. But if so, work that thing in, it'll be a blast. Yeah. And I'll say also kind of on the opposite end of that, not maybe not in the same vein as trying to replicate a sprint, but for somebody that is coming back from injury or they're a little bit banged up, a heavy sled push can be such a great proxy for a max load, um, like deadlift or a squat or whatever. Like maybe that person is not quite ready to be loaded up and have their skeleton bear the weight of whatever they're lifting. Like you know, obviously you want to work towards that. There's a lot of benefit to that. But if they're not quite there yet, you can get a lot done with a sled, either dragging or pushing with a pretty significant weight. And it's not going to put a lot of tax on the body in that same way. So you can be pretty aggressive um, with that, even if you have somebody who is, you know, relatively hesitant you know, obviously you gotta you gotta play it by ear and you have to go with what you know on that athlete. You gotta be prudent, but it's a nice way to kind of get exposure to load without taking a big toll. So that's that's a fun way to start incorporating sleds too, if somebody's not quite ready to get back to the heavy weights. It's actually the last the last point that I had on my list was if you had a little little zap in your back, you know, or a little <laughs> a little a little something that was feeling a little off that sleds appropriately yep. used could be a wonderful stepping stone to to get back to where you needed to be and absolutely I, I used to break out my prowler and sled regularly when for about a year i was training a small group of older athletes all uh, above 55 some upwards of 80 years old in my garage and the sled just an empty sled for that cohort mm -hmm. of individuals at an appropriate distance just pushing it back and forth it, that was basically a heavy day. There was a strength building oh, yeah. posterior chain yep. day without me having to get them loaded up under the barbell and squatted it as we worked towards those movements at the same time. Yep. But the sled made a very regular uh, appearance, not only the prowler, but also the drag sled that like has the two straps you can like throw over your shoulders mm -hmm. and whatnot, both walking with it in a normal position and then dragging it as you pull backwards and you just hold on to the two straps and yep. pulling that thing backwards if you haven't it just hits different <laughs> special treat special it's, treat it's a special I, treat i love sleds and have for a long time my love affair with them started early before they were really commercially available i would build them and uh, I had one, this is way back in the early San Francisco CrossFit days where I might've told this story before, but I had a, uh, a steel mailbox that I had found somewhere, like an old post office, like mail solid box. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cut a pair of skis and, <laughs> and it then bolted them to this, to this box. Nice. And then I used, I used, uh, uh, pipe. I went to Home Depot and just got some, you know, utility pipe, whatever, and just created with the elbows and the pipe lengths some uprights, and I bolted that to the uh, to the back of this box and created a push sled. Now oh, that's it didn't last very long because we ran through the skis on the pavement pretty fast. <laughs> but did the turns trick. out they're not designed for that. But you know, we did have a couple of weeks of a sled before they were really available to purchase from a lot of these companies that you can just, you know one one click buy them on the internet these days and and it was a lot of fun so yeah sleds are awesome in my book i think if i had to pick one thing 
that I was going to add to the toolkit, like say I'm building out a garage gym, you've got barbells, you've got a dumbbell or two, you have a couple kettlebells and you're like, okay, what next? Mm. To me, a sled is top of that list. It's just, it's just fun. You know, if you make your yep. way, now we're on story time. If you make your way <laughs> to my house here one day, we've got a bit of a long driveway. It's about 80 feet. And there's a, just a workout that we do here every now and then just 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 for fun it's three short little rounds of it's an empty sled empty prowler three short little rounds of like 10 calories on the echo bike down and back with the sled just three times through so you can just move it's just horrific of course it's terrible and you're familiar with a competition called the crossfit games right i've heard of it i've heard of it what what year was it? 2013 or 14? Wasn't there a really cool workout that had the sled pull paired with a was it with paired with a handstand push up? Wasn't like a hand over hand pull where the sled got right. heavier the Coliseum, and heavier? Yeah. I want to mm-hmm. say. And then yep. was it a, was it a strict handstand push up or something I like that? I think it might have even been a deficit handstand push up. Oh, you might have been right. Yep. Yeah. You might have been right. So I hear about that one every now and then because my wife competed that year. And yep. then I think the other thing which used a sled one of the years that she competed and she has like nightmares about it to this day because how how effective sleds are was I think it was just an empty sled just like sprint across sprint across <laughs> the field <laughs> that was it that was it just empty the That's tank it. <laughs> yep. uh, and terrible it, it left an amazing mark so you can get a lot of good work done with sleds and I that's everything I'll give you one of my... I've got on my list go ahead. Well, one of my favorite now is now really on story time. When we uh, were on the road doing seminars and we would work out at lunch, one of my favorite finishers, you know, if we did like a, a workout that wasn't that um, strenuous or like didn't have a lot of volume to it or whatever, or people just felt like they needed an extra little something, I was like, okay, great. We'd grab an empty sled and we'd wow. get in groups of three. You'd have two people on one side and one person on the other, and you would do a three person rotation. So one person, uh, starting with the people on the partner side, so two two on that side, one person would run it down, and then the person on the other side would run it back, and the third person would run it down, and you would just continue that rotation. So effectively, it was a one to two rest interval. Beautiful on a on a fast sled, and you would just keep doing that until somebody said, "I've had enough." <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yep. I like that a lot, actually. I really it was do. Great. It was a lot of fun. But I know I've only got one last thing, and this is kind sure. of getting us back down to to the uh, not to, to the, the topic. situation here. Yeah. And this is a concept that I think everybody should think about when we're talking about fitness being broad and general, etc. Whether we're talking about barbells, whether we're talking about specialty equipment or odd objects or whatever, it's important to remember that the more specialized you get and the further down the track with that thing that you get, the less carryover there's going to be to other things. And so for example, If you are somebody that is interested in lifting a 400 pound stone off the ground, Mm. I mean, number one, you've got to be just ridiculously strong all over, fair enough. But the specific technique that's going to be developed for that lift isn't really going to have a lot of carryover to other things. In the same way that eventually, when you're talking about just a deadlift or a squat or whatever, Gaining another five to 10 pounds in that lift doesn't really have a lot of utility elsewhere. You're strong enough that now you're talking about these Mm -hmm. fractions of a percent, and it's not really going to impact the breadth of your fitness the same way that going from, you know, a beginner's deadlift to like a pretty modestly good deadlift would. Mm -hmm. So it's important to remember that concept, no matter what you get into at a certain point, there's a diminishing return. And if you're really fired up on like, well, I got to get that you know, yoke carry up to to X amount of weight, cool. But just remember that in the grand scheme of things, it may not have the the crossover benefit that you were interested in initially. So just kind of reassess on that if you really fall in love with with any one of these things. Yep. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that's odd objects, everybody. Uh, Super fun. Love the whole love the whole topic. Hopefully that gives some insight and benefit to people to work them into their workouts if they have the opportunity or maybe this helped identify what might be the purchase number one or two if you're thinking about going down that road eventually so those are some of our favorite workouts or ways to work them in but what i would love to see is in the comments on the btwb youtube channel under this episode 
if you've got a cool workout that involves an odd object, leave it there. I'd love to see it. I'll let you know if I do it. I'll give you a shout out in a future show and tell you if I vomited or not or whatever it happened to be. <laughs> and, you know, let us know what you think. Are there some that we missed? Which ones do you think have incredible utility? How have you worked them in? Let's just kind of share that information so that everybody's better for it. So as always, thanks for your support. Thanks for watching or listening. For Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.